Sometimes it takes place, redemption that is, as the Holy Spirit unfolds to the anxious soul the great truth that Christ is the Savior of a sinner. You have long been waiting for some offering, some gift, some price with which to come, long lingering on the margin of the fountain, waiting for some preparation to enter. In other words, for it amounts to this, waiting to feel less vile, less unworthy, in order that you may be more welcome. And now the Blessed Spirit opens to your mind that great and precious truth that Christ died for the ungodly, that He is the mighty and the willing Savior of a sinner, that no gift, no price is asked, no previous fitness or self-preparation is necessary, that the more vile and unworthy, the more fit and the more welcome. Oh, what an impression of the seal is this upon a wounded heart, when the glorious announcement is brought home to the soul, a full and free pardon for a poor sinner, the blood of Jesus cleansing from sin. Is it any marvel that no change of time or circumstance can obliterate the impression or the remembrance of that moment from the mind? It was a sealing of pardon upon a heart which God had made soft, and which was the sure prelude to, indeed, the beginning of eternal glory. But in most cases, the sealing of the Spirit is a more gradual work. It is a work of time. The soul is placed in the school of deep experience and is led on step by step, stage by stage. The knowledge of self and of Christ increases. Deeper views of indwelling sin are discovered. The heart's treachery is more acutely felt. The devices of Satan are better known. The mystery of God's gracious and providential dealings with His children is more clearly unfolded and better understood. And all this, it may be, is arrived at through a process, the deep, painful, yet sanctified discipline of the covenant, so that years may elapse before a child of the covenant attains to the full sealing of the Spirit. And yet, blessed be God, the work of regeneration is so perfect in itself the blotting out of all a believer's sins so complete and his justification so entire that a saint of God dying in the first stages of the divine life is safe forever. May we not refer to the thief upon the cross as an example illustrating and confirming this? There are then degrees or progressive stages of the Spirit's sealing. The first impression is made in regeneration. This is often faint and in numerous cases scarcely perceptible, especially it is so in ordinary conversions. We mean by ordinary conversions those that occur under the common influences of the Spirit in the use of the stated means of grace. Where the Holy Spirit descends in an especial and extraordinary manner, as the history of the American churches and more recently of many of our own land testifies that he sometimes does, Conversions assume a more marked character and type. They are clearer, more perceptible, and undoubted. The work is of a deeper kind. Views of sin are more pungent. The law work of the soul more thorough. And when the soul emerges from its gloomy night of conviction into the glorious light of pardon, it seems more like the perfect day of God's forgiveness. There is, in a work of grace transpiring during an especial outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a deeper impression of the seal of the Spirit upon the heart, a clearer and more manifest sense of pardon and acceptance than in the normal conversions of ordinary times. Nor is this difficult to account for. There is a greater and richer manifestation of the Holy Ghost. This is the grand secret. He gives more of Himself. He imparts more of His anointing influences. And the larger the degree we possess of the quickening, sanctifying influences of the Spirit, the more in proportion do we know of His sealing operation. How this thought should awaken the desire and impart power and fervency to prayer for a more enlarged communication of the Holy Ghost. Ceaseless should be the cry, Lord, fill me with the Spirit. But, as we have remarked, in conversions occurring under the more ordinary instrumentalities, the first impression of the seal of the Spirit is often but little beneath the surface. The work of grace is feeble. 
It may be compared to the faint outline of a picture. The design is there, the idea of the artist is seen, but the fullness of its parts, the coloring, the light and shade are wanting to the perfection of the whole. It may be compared also to the first streak of morning light before it deepens into perfect day, or to the gentle rising of the rivulet ere it widens into the broad river. Its beginnings are feeble and yet real. The light is not less light because it is but a faint and struggling ray, nor is the rivulet less a rivulet because it issues feebly and almost unseen. Grace loses nothing of the greatness and glory of its character in the smallness of its degree. An infant loses nothing of its identity with its species because it is not a perfect man, nor does the father disown it as his child because it is the smallest and the feeblest of his family. Oh, no! Feeble grace is still divine grace, and he who touches but the hem, as it were, is as much saved and shall be as surely glorified as he whose faith removes the mountain and casts it into the sea. The first impression is as much the work of the Spirit as any deeper one in after years. Let not the weak believer overlook or undervalue what God has done for him. That feeble light, that little strength, that faint and flickering ray, that touching but the hem, oh, it is the blessed product of God, the eternal Spirit. Nature never taught you your sinfulness, your worthlessness, your vileness, your nothingness. Flesh of and blood never revealed to you the absolute necessity of a better righteousness than your own, nor led you to Jesus as your wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. Then give glory to the Lord your God for what He has done. Praise, O oh, praise Him for the work He has wrought in you. Tell to others the wonders of His love, His grace, and His power. Confess His name before angels and men. Be very diligent in seeking large and yet larger supplies of that little river that maketh glad the city of God, in whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that holy spirit of promise. But a yet deeper impression of the seal is made when the believer is led more fully into the realization of his sonship, when he attains to the blessed sense of the adoption of children. Although it is most true that the moment a sinner believes in Jesus, he becomes actually an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ, and enters into the family as an adopted child, yet the clear and undoubted sense of this vast mercy may not be sealed upon his heart until later years. He may long have walked without the sweet sense of God's adopting love in his heart. The frame of his spirit and the language of his soul in prayer may have been more akin to that of the son of the bondwoman than the son of the free woman. He may have known but little of the free spirit, the spirit of an adopted child, and may seldom have gone to God as a kind, loving, tender, and faithful father. But now the divine sealer, the eternal Spirit of God, enters afresh and impresses deeply upon his soul the unutterably sweet and abiding sense of his adoption. Oh, what an impression is then left upon his heart when all his legal fears are calmed, when all his slavish moanings are hushed, when all his bondage spirit is gone. And when under the drawings of filial love he approaches the throne of grace and cries, My father! And his father responds, My child, thou shalt call me my father and shalt not turn away from me. Jeremiah 3.19 In whom also after that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. In the process of sanctified affliction... The soul often receives a fresh and a deep impress of the seal of the Spirit. The furnace works wonders for a believer. Oh, that he should ever wish to be exempt from it. Indeed, it may be remarked that real grace is inseparable from a state of trials and tribulations. Where there is real faith, the Lord will try it. Where there is the true ore, the refiner will prove it in the furnace. There is not a grace of the Spirit but, more or less, and at one time or another, Jesus tries that grace, the Lord trieth the righteous. 
He tries their principles, tries their graces, tries their obedience, proves his own work, brings out the new man in all its muscular fitness, develops the nature and character of his work, and shows it to be his mighty product, and in all respects worthy of himself. Much then, as we would wish at times, exemption from a state of trial, anxious for the more smooth and easy path. Yet, if we are really born of God, and His grace has truly made us one of His family, like them we have been chosen in the furnace of affliction, and with them in the furnace we are brought into the possession of some of the most costly blessings of our lives. Real grace, then, is tried grace. And note how, in the process of its trial, the blessed and eternal Spirit more deeply seals the believer. The hour of affliction is the hour of softening. Job bore this testimony. He maketh my heart soft. The hardness of the heart yields. The callousness of the Spirit gives way. The affections become tender. Conscience is more susceptible. It is the season of holy abstraction, meditation, and prayer, of withdrawal from the world and from creature delights, while the soul is more closely shut in with God. The heart, now emptied, humbled, and softened, is prepared for the seal of the Spirit. And what an impression is then made! What discoveries of God's love to the soul! What enlarged views of the personal glory of Christ, of the infinite perfection of His work, of the preciousness of the atoning sacrifice, of the hatefulness of sin, and of the beauty of holiness. His own personal interest in this great work of Christ is made more clear and certain to his soul. The Spirit bears fresh witness to his acceptance and seals him anew with the adopting love of God. It was the psalmist's wisdom to acknowledge, It is good for me that I have been afflicted. Let it not be then forgotten that an afflicting time is often a sealing time. We would remark in this connection that the sealing of the Spirit does not always imply a rejoicing state. It is not necessarily accompanied by great spiritual joy. While we cannot forget that it is the believer's privilege to be always rejoicing, rejoice evermore, and that a state of spiritual joy is as much a holy as it is a happy state, yet we cannot suppose that the sealed ones are always in possession of this fruit of the Spirit. It is perhaps more a state of rest in God, a state of holy quietude and peace, which in many cases seldom rises to that of joy. There is an unclouded hope, a firm and unshaken resting on the finished work, a humble reliance on the stability of the covenant and on the immutability of God's love, which is never moved even when there is no sensible enjoyment and when comfort seems to die. It is a state corresponding to that which David thus expresses, Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. Perhaps it is more akin to Job's frame of soul when he exclaimed, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. A sense of comfort may be withdrawn, joy may be absent, the sun of righteousness casting but a faint twilight over the soul, and yet such is the power of faith grasping the cross of Christ, such is the firm resting of the soul upon the stability of the covenant, upon what God is and upon what He has promised, that without one note of joy or one ray of light the believer can yet say, I know whom I have believed. And why we ask this strong and vigorous reliance? Why this buoying up of the soul in the absence of sensible comfort? We reply that it is because that soul has attained unto the sealing of the Spirit. This forms the great secret. This conducts us to another reflection. The believer will never lose the sealing of the Spirit. The impression of God's pardoning love made upon the heart by the Holy Ghost is never entirely erased. We do not say that there are no moments when the consolations of God are small with the believer, when he shall have no severe fightings within and fears without, 
when the experience of the church shall be his, I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself, and was gone, my soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave no answer. Song of Solomon. All this he may experience and still not lose the sealing of the Spirit. In the midst of it all, even in the lowest depth, there shall be the abiding conviction of an interest in God's love, which sustains, animates, and comforts. It will be seen by reverting to the state of the church alluded to in the Song of Solomon, that although there was the consciousness of her beloved's withdrawal, although he was gone, and she sought him but could not find him, called him, but he gave her no answer, yet not for one moment did she lose the impression that he still was her beloved. Here was the glorious triumph of faith in the hour when all was loneliness, desolation, and joylessness. Here was the sealing of the Spirit which never left her, even though her beloved had gone. And while not a beam of his beauty glanced upon her soul, nor a note of his voice fell upon her ear, she still could look up and exclaim, I am my beloved's, and my beloved's is mine. O oh, mighty power of faith that can anchor the soul firm on Jesus in the darkest and wildest tempest. And this is indeed the sealing of the Spirit. It is the Holy Ghost so deeply impressing on the heart a sense of pardoning love, so firmly establishing it in the faithfulness of God, in the finished work of our Lord and Savior, in the stability of the covenant, and in the soul's adoption into the one family, that in the gloomiest hour, and under the most trying dispensation, there is that which keeps the soul steady to its center, Jehovah Jesus and even should his son go down behind a mist, he has the sustaining assurance that it will rise upon another world in peerless, cloudless splendor. Oh, yes, the sealing of the Spirit is a permanent abiding impression. It is unto the day of redemption, the day when there shall be no more conflict, no more darkness, no more sin, it is not to the day of pardon, for he cannot be more entirely pardoned than he is. It is not to the day of acceptance, for he cannot be more fully accepted than now. Oh, no, it is to the glorious day of redemption, the day of complete emancipation, longed for by you sons of God, and even sighed for by the whole creation, Romans chapter 8, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. O oh, shout for joy, you who are sealed of the Lord, tried and afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted, you who find the world to be but a wilderness and a veil of tears, the path rougher and rougher, narrower and narrower. Lift up your heads with joy, the hour of your redemption draweth nigh, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. And this is your security, a faithful, covenant-keeping God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. In closing this chapter, we would remark in the first place that it is the duty and the privilege of every believer diligently and prayerfully to seek the sealing of the Spirit. He rests short of his great privilege if he slights or undervalues this blessing. Do not be satisfied with the impression which you received in conversion. In other words, do not rest content with past experiences. And many are satisfied with a mere hope that they once passed from death unto life, and with this feeble and, in many cases, doubtful evidence, they are content to pass all their days and to go down to the grave. Ah, reader, if you are really converted and your soul is in a healthy, growing, spiritual state, you will want more than this and especially, too, if you're led into deeper self-knowledge, into a more intimate acquaintance with the roughness of the rough way and the straightness of the straight path, you will want a present Christ to lean upon and to live upon. 
past experience will not do for you, save only as it confirms your soul in the faithfulness of God. Forgetting those things that are behind, you will seek a present pardon, a present sense of acceptance. And the daily question as you near your eternal home will be, how do I stand now with God? Is Jesus precious to my soul now? Is He my daily food? What do I experience of daily visits from and to Him? Do I more and more see my own vileness, emptiness, and poverty, and His righteousness, grace, and fullness? And should the summons come now, I'm ready to depart and to be with Christ. As you value a happy and a holy walk, as you would be jealous for the honor and glory of the Lord, as you wish to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, and to be a savor of Christ in every place, oh, seek, seek the sealing of the Spirit. Do not rest short of it. Reach after it. Press towards it. It is your duty. Oh, that the duty may be your privilege. Then shall you exclaim with an unfaltering tongue, Abba, Father my Lord and my God. Again, I remark, this blessing is only found in the way of God's appointment. He has ordained that prayer should be the great channel through which His covenant blessing should flow into your soul. If it is your anxious desire to attain to this blessing, I would quote for your direction a remark of that eminent servant of Christ, Dr. Thomas Goodwin, quote, be sure of this, says he, that before God ever communicates any good to your soul, he puts your soul in a state of holiness to receive it. Unquote. To confirm and illustrate this thought, let me ask, what was the state of the apostles when the Holy Spirit descended upon them in his witnessing, anointing, and sealing influences? Acts chapter 1, it is described in these words, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren. Verse 14, what is the important lesson thus taught us? That God would have his child in a waiting, seeking, supplicating posture and in this holy state prepared to receive the high attainment we plead for. Do you earnestly desire the sealing of the Spirit? Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. As surely as you petition for it, sincerely, humbly, believingly, seeking it in the name of Jesus, through the cross of Christ you shall have it. The Lord of the Spirit is ready to impart the Spirit to you. It is the fresh gift of His love, without respect to any worth or worthiness on the part of the soul that receives it. The Spirit of God is a gift of grace for the poor, the dependent, the unworthy, those who are little in their own eyes and little in the eyes of others. And if this is your conscious state, then the Holy Ghost is for you. And oh, the blessed results! Who can describe them? Sealed! How will all your legal fears and unbelieving doubts in a moment vanish away? Your soul, so long fettered and imprisoned, shall now go free. The cross you have so long looked at, not daring to bow your shoulder to it, shall now be taken up with a cheerful mind. Christ's yoke, so long resisted, will now be easy, and His burden, so long refused, will now be light. And with a heart enlarged with the love of Jesus, you will run the way of His commandments, esteeming His precepts better than life. Prayer, importunate prayer, will bring the blessing we plead for into your soul. Seek it with your whole heart. Seek it diligently, perseveringly. Seek it by day and by night. Seek it in all the means of grace, in every way of God's appointment. Especially seek it in the name of Jesus as the purchased blessing of His atoning blood. Ask what you will in my name, or his own encouraging words, and it shall be granted unto you. Then ask for the sealing of the Spirit. Ask nothing less. More you do not want. Feel that you have not attained until you possess it, that you have not apprehended that for which you also are apprehended of in Christ Jesus until you have received the Holy Ghost as a sealer. 
It is, and has long been, the solemn conviction of this writer that much of the spiritual darkness, the lack of spiritual consolation, the stunted piety, the harassing doubts and fears, the imperfect apprehensions of Jesus, the feeble faith, the sickly, drooping state of the soul, the uncertainty of full acceptance in Christ, which marks so many of the professing people of God in this our day, may be traced to the absence of a deep sealing of the Spirit. Resting satisfied with the faint impression in conversion, with the dim views you then had of Christ, and the feeble apprehension of your acceptance and adoption, is it any marvel that all your lifetime you should be in bondage through slavish doubts and fears, fears that you should never attain to the stature of perfect men in Christ Jesus, that you should never rise to the humble boldness, the unwavering confidence, the blessed assurance, and the holy dignity of the sons of God? Oh, no! You rest short of this blessing. You stay at the door of the ark. You remain upon the border of the goodly land, and not entering fully in, you experience the effects which we have described. But the richest ore lies buried the deepest. The sweetest fruit is on the higher branches. The strongest light is nearer the sun. In other words, if you desire more knowledge of Christ, of your full pardon and complete acceptance, if we desire the earnest of our inheritance, and even now would taste the grapes of Eshkol, we must be reaching forth unto those things that are before. We must press toward the mark, and not rest until our rest is found in a clear, unclouded, immovable, and a holy assurance of our being in Christ. And this is only experienced in the sealing of the Spirit. Again, we say, with all the earnestness which a growing sense of the vastness of the blessing inspires, seek to be sealed of the Spirit. Seek the earnest of the Spirit. Seek to be filled with the Spirit. Seek the anointing of the Spirit. Seek the Spirit of adoption. Do not say that it's too immense a blessing, too high an attainment for one so small, so feeble, so obscure, so unworthy as you. Oh, do not thus malign the grace of God. All His blessings are the bestowments of grace, and grace means free favor to the most unworthy. Anyone who reads this page under the blessed sealing of the Spirit, look up through Jesus to God the Father. Low views of self, deep consciousness of vileness, poverty of state or of spirit are no objections with God, but rather strong arguments that prevail with Him to give you the blessing. Only ask, only believe, only persevere, and you shall obtain it. Only ask. It is in the heart of the Spirit to seal unto the day of redemption all who believe in Jesus May it be in the heart of the reader to desire the blessing, seeing that it is so freely and richly offered. Reader, whose superscription do you bear? It may be your reply is, I want Christ, I secretly long for Him, I desire Him above all beside. Is it so? Then take courage and go to Jesus. Go to Him simply. Go to Him unhesitatingly. Go to Him immediately. That desire is from Him. Let the desire from Him lead you to Him. That secret longing is the work of the Spirit. And having begotten it there, do you think that He will not honor it and welcome you when you come? Try Him. Bring Him to the touchstone of His own truth. Prove me now herewith, is His gracious invitation. Take His promise. Him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. Plead it in wrestlings at the mercy seat, and see if He will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Go to him just as you are. If you cannot take to him a pure heart, take an impure one. If you cannot take to him a broken heart, take a whole one. If you cannot take to him a soft heart, take a hard one. Only go to him. The very act of going will be blessed to you. And oh, such is the strength of his love Such is his yearning, compassion, and melting tenderness of heart for poor 
sinners such is his ability and willingness to save that he will no more cast you out than deny his own existence. Precious Lord Jesus, set us as a seal upon thine heart, and by thy Spirit seal thyself upon our hearts, and give us, unworthy though we are, a place among them which are sealed. Chapter 7, The Witness of the Spirit, Jesus, the True God, and His Work All-Sufficient. 1 John 5:10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. We have now looked at the work of the Spirit in some of its solemn and important aspects. We have considered His quickening, indwelling, sanctifying, and sealing offices, and the spiritual eye will not have failed to discover the intimate and beautiful relation of each of these separate parts of his work to the others, and of all of them to the perfection and symmetry of his work as a whole. One important point at least must have been established in the mind, and that is the equality of the personal glory of the Spirit with the first and second persons of the adorable Trinity. The work ascribed to him in the preceding pages, and proved from Scripture to belong especially to him, can only be predicated of a divine being. On this essential doctrine of divine truth, we cannot too frequently nor too strongly insist. With regard to our real belief in it, we cannot institute too rigid an examination. It is to be feared that the principles of many professing Christians need sifting on this point. We profess a belief in his distinct personality in the Godhead. Do we worship the Holy Spirit as such? We acknowledge His supreme divinity. Do we render to Him divine honor by reposing in Him our faith, hope, and love? We admit as an article of our creeds that He sustains an equal part in our salvation with the Father and the Son. Do we render to Him equal praise and glory? On these important points, may there not exist a painful want of harmony between our professed belief and its corresponding practice? And we would humbly suggest the consideration, may not the small measure of the anointing, sanctifying, and sealing influence of the Spirit, which many professing Christians appear to possess, be mainly attributed as a cause to the low views they entertain of the personal dignity of the Spirit? Can any believer expect a growth of spirituality, an increase of vital godliness in his soul, while he secretly, and it may be unsuspectingly, cherishes opinions derogatory to the personal glory of the Holy Ghost? Never. His gracious and all-important work is inseparably connected with the glory of his person. His deity imparts to his work its efficacy, and his personality its adaptation to our peculiar circumstances. And may we never look for the unction that anoints, for the light that instructs, for the seal that testifies, or the influence that sanctifies while we secretly or openly whittle away His personal glory and refuse the Holy Ghost the honor, the praise, and the worship that are His just and proper due. The force of these remarks will be felt as we advance in the discussion of the subject immediately before us. The witness of the Spirit is a highly important and blessed part of His great work. Hence we find repeated and marked allusions to it in the Word of God. The following are sufficient to prove it a doctrine of Revelation. John 15, 26, He, the Spirit, shall testify of me. Hebrews 10, 15, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. 1 John 5, 6, And it is the Spirit that beareth witness. Romans 8, 16, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. In view of what has been advanced touching the personal character of the Spirit, it will be the less necessary that we enlarge at length upon his qualifications as a witness of his perfect competence for this office. There can be no question. It is essential to a competent witness that he should be of sound mind and capable of judging of the facts to which he testifies. In a preeminent degree, this belongs to the Holy Spirit. Thus, the language of prophecy speaks of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon Him, Christ, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, Isaiah 11, 2. 
who will deny that the Spirit in this respect is a competent witness to testify of the Lord Jesus to the church. It is another indispensable qualification that he who testifies to a fact should do so from a personal knowledge of the fact which he attests. The Holy Spirit, the witness, is intimately acquainted with every fact which he relates and with the nature and the truth of the work to which he testifies. His testimony is not grounded upon the knowledge or the evidence of others, what he has heard, but upon his own personal knowledge, upon what he knows of the great facts to the truth of which he witnesses. The Holy Spirit reveals to his people what no creature I ever saw, nor ear heard, nor heart conceived, unless first enlightened and renewed by him. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God." As a distinct person in the Godhead, it is impossible that it should be otherwise. He must know all that passes within the hidden recesses of the divine mind, no depths of God, but he fathoms them, all the designs of Jehovah's mind, the counsels of his will, the thoughts of his heart, the purposes of his grace, and the acts of his love are known to the eternal spirit. By him, as far as the revelation involves the happiness and holiness of the saints, they are disclosed to them. His knowledge, let it be remembered, arises from his essential union with the divine essence, without which he must have remained eternally ignorant. The judgments of God are a great deep, which no creature line, not the most capacious, finite intellect could ever fathom. The reasonableness of the accounting in this way for the secret knowledge of the Spirit is thus argued by the Apostle, referring to the same principle in man. He reasons, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. It requires no further argument or illustration to show that a full and minute personal knowledge of the facts to which he witnesses is a qualification belonging to the Spirit. One more qualification is essential. He who assumes the character of a witness should be known for the strictest probity. If the veracity of the witness cannot bear the closest investigation, his witness is not true. Preeminently does this qualification attach itself to the blessed Spirit. Truth in relation to him is an adjunct, but an essential characteristic. It is his very essence to deprive him of it, or in the slightest degree to question it, would be to undeify him. He cannot exist without being true. As sustaining this character, he is emphatically spoken of in the word, howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. John 16:13. John 16:16 16, 16 and 17 and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever even the spirit of truth and it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth 1 John 5:6 thus does the spirit possess all the essential qualifications of a competent witness he is the spirit of wisdom and understanding he searches the depths of god He is the Spirit of Truth. We proceed to specify some of those important facts to which especially the Spirit witnesses. And in the first place, the Spirit is a witness to the truth of God's Word. It is no small attainment to arrive at the full belief of the heart in the truth of the divine record. We are not speaking now of the historical credence which an enlightened judgment may yield, but of a higher faith than this. Nor do we confine ourselves to that entire ascent of the mind and trembling belief of the heart upon the grounds of which the soul may have ventured an humble reliance upon Christ, although this is no small attainment. But we allude to that firm, unmoved and unmovable belief of the truth, which is often an after work, a work of time and of deep experience, before the heart becomes thoroughly schooled into it. Let it not be supposed that we undervalue the smallest degree of faith to believe that God's word is true 
and on the strength of that belief to be willing to renounce all other dependence and to rest simply and implicitly upon its revealed plan of salvation is a blessed attainment, an attainment only to be realized by the power of the Holy Ghost. But to know it from a deep experience of its sanctifying power, from the heartfelt preciousness and fulfillment of its promises, from its sustaining and soothing influence in sorrow, its all-sufficient light in darkness and perplexity, to be brought to trust the naked promise because God has spoken it, to believe and to go forward because He has said it, is a still higher step in faith's ladder and a more illustrious display of the grace and power of the Spirit. It is an unspeakable mercy to be well grounded in the belief of the truth. Let those speak who have thus been blessedly taught. Let them testify that God's word was, when they first believed, as a sealed book compared to what it is now, that since they have advanced in the divine life, led and instructed by the spirit of truth, it has opened to their minds with all the light and freshness of a new revelation. Doctrine once mysterious, now beautifully clear, promises once unfelt, now sweetly consolatory. Precepts once insipid are now powerfully persuasive. And to what is this maturity of the heart in the full belief of the truth to be ascribed? We unhesitatingly reply to the witness of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost deepening His work in the heart, teaching the soul more experimentally, and guiding it more fully into all truth. In a word, bringing the truth more vividly to the mind with convincing power. Nor can we refrain from remarking that this deeper experience of the truth of God is frequently the result of sore but sanctified trials. A believer knows but imperfectly what he is in himself or what the truth of God is to him until placed in circumstances favorable to the development of both. The Lord will have His people, and especially the ministers of His gospel, experimentally acquainted with His truth. They shall not testify of an unknown, unfelt, and unexperienced Savior. They shall be enabled to say, That which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, declare we unto you. And more valuable and precious is one grain of the truth of God experienced in the heart and then the whole system occupying a place only in the judgment to deepen then their knowledge of the truth to ground and settle them in it to bring it out in all its practical power a good a covenant God often places his children in sore trial and temptation it is in the storm and the hurricane amid rocks and shoals that the mariner becomes practically acquainted with his science all that he knew before he launched his vessel on the ocean or encountered the storm was but the theory of the school. But a single tempest, one escape from shipwreck, has imparted more experimental knowledge than years of mere theoretical toil. So learns the believer. Oh, how theoretical and defective our views of divine truth. How little our knowledge of our own heart, of our deep corruptions, perfect weakness and little faith, how imperfect our acquaintance with the fullness, preciousness, all-sufficiency and sympathy of Jesus until the hand of God falls upon us. And when, as with Job, messenger after messenger has brought the tidings of disaster upon disaster, brought down and laid low like Job, we are brought to confess, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job 42, 5 and 6. But before we pass to consider the testimony of the Spirit that bears for Christ, there is yet another step, so to speak, which must ever precede the manifestation of Jesus to the soul, and that is the witness which the Spirit bears to the holiness, spirituality, and justice of the divine law. This is a preliminary step. Conviction of sin by the law of God in the hands of the eternal spirit must ever precede faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It is with many a favorite theory to deny that the Holy Spirit is the convincer of sin, but to deny this is to oppose the mind and conscience to the clear and express testimony of the Holy Bible. And when he, the Comforter, is come, he will reprove or convince the world of sin. John 16, 8. This is the great office of the Spirit. This is his first work. Prior to his bringing the soul to rest on the great sacrifice for sin, not a step will the soul take to Christ until it has been brought in guilty and condemned by the law of God to the cross. And this is the work of the Spirit. No man, wrote the excellent John Newton, never did or ever will feel himself to be a lost, miserable, and hateful sinner unless he be powerfully and supernaturally convinced by the Spirit of God. And what is the instrument by which the Spirit thus powerfully and supernaturally convinces of sin? We reply, the law. By the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20 The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. The law brought into the conscience by the Holy Ghost condemns the man and leads him to condemn himself. It holds up to view the holiness of God, the purity and inflexibility of every precept, contrasts it with the unrighteousness, guilt, and misery of the sinner, until the soul prostrate in the dust exclaims in all the lowliness, of self-accusation. The law is holy, just, and good. I am guilty, guilty, guilty. What need have we of further testimony than that of the apostle? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law sin was dead, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Romans 7, 7 through 9. Through this instrument, the law of God, the Holy Spirit effectually convinces the soul of sin and lays it low before God. We now come to show in what particular way the Spirit testifies of Christ to the believer. Our warrant for believing this comes from our dear Lord's own words. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 15, 26. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. John 16, 14. First, the Spirit in witnessing to the glory of the person of Christ, testifies to his supreme, absolute deity. Strong is the testimony of the Holy Ghost in the Word to the essential deity of our blessed Lord. And if he has laid such amazing stress upon it, surely it should be a solemn matter with us how we think of and treat it. The great, the grand glory of Emmanuel is his essential glory, the glory of his Godhead, It is only in this light that we can approach him with the hope of pardon and acceptance. It is then we talk of him as a mediator. It is then we view him as the great sin-bearer of his people. It is then we contemplate him as their surety, their righteousness, their covenant head. In vain should we speak of his atoning blood, of his finished righteousness, of his mediatorial fullness, if we could not look up to him in the glory he had with the Father before the world was. It is this that imparts such efficacy to his work and throws such a surpassing luster around it. And what is the witness of the Spirit to this doctrine? It is this, that all the names, the perfections, the works, and the worship proper only to deity belong to Christ, thus proclaiming him with a loud voice to be what he really is, Jehovah Jesus. Consider the evidence. Jesus of Nazareth, the anointed Savior of poor sinners, is emphatically styled the Great God, Titus 2, 13, the Mighty God, Isaiah 9, 6, the Only Wise God, Jude 25, the True God, 1 John 5, 20, and the Only Lord God, Jude 4, 
The name Jehovah peculiarly belongs to God. It is never in a solitary instance applied to a mere creature. I am Jehovah. That is my name. And yet the very name is ascribed to Jesus by the Holy Ghost. This is the name whereby he shall be called Jehovah, our righteousness. He is then Jehovah, Jesus, God, over all, blessed forevermore. Could testimony be more clear and decisive? O oh, precious truth on which to live! O oh, glorious rock on which to die! Jesus is Jehovah. He is Emmanuel, God with us. God was manifest in the flesh. Hold fast to this truth. Let nothing weaken your grasp upon it. It is your plank, your lifeboat, your ark, your all. This gone, all goes with it. You will need it when you come to die. In that solemn hour when all else fails you, when sin in battle array rises before you, and you think of the holiness of a holy God, then you will want a rock to stand upon. Then, as the Spirit leads you in death to Jesus, the rock testifies to your soul of His blood, witnesses to His Godhead, unfolds Him in His essential glory, you will be able to shout with your last breath, Victory! Victory! As you pass safely and triumphantly over Jordan, the blood that speaks peace will be felt to be efficacious, the righteousness that justifies will be seen to be glorious, and the rock that sustains will be felt to be firm and unmovable, even unto death, as the blessed glorifier of Christ witnesses to the truth of his deity. Oh, then to see the lawgiver in the character of the law fulfiller. Set a high value on the doctrine of our Lord's deity. Guard it with a jealous eye to behold the God-man obeying, suffering, dying, and therefore the law honored, justice satisfied, and the Father well pleased. Truly may the believing soul adopt the triumphant language of the apostle and take up the challenge. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Set a high value on the doctrine of our Lord's deity. Guard it with a jealous eye. Pray to be established in the full experimental belief of it. For the more you see of the dignity of his person, the more you will see of the glory of his work. The Spirit witnesses to the personal glory of Christ as God-man. There are many believers who unhesitatingly admit the doctrine of our Lord's humanity, but do not delight to linger around those passages in the Holy Bible which prove and unfold it, lest an essential inferiority in Jesus should be implied, and an impression should be left upon the mind unfavorable to his personal dignity. But this arises from the lack of an enlarged, harmonious, and scriptural view of the divine method of salvation. Viewed in its proper aspect, the humanity of our Lord will be found to occupy a place in that scheme as important and essential to its perfection as his deity. The humanity was pure humanity, and the deity absolute deity. But the mysterious union of the two in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ constituted him the proper and the one mediator between God and men. Glorious is this aspect of our Lord's complex person, and full and clear is the testimony of the Spirit to its truth. Thus we read, The Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.14 In the following passages, Christ is evidently spoken of as subordinate to the Father, but only His mediatorial character is under consideration. There cannot be the slightest essential inferiority. It would be fatal to His entire work. The following passage would seem to imply an inferiority in Christ, but an inferiority only of office, not of nature. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. John 5:19. 
That these words of our Lord refer to his divine nature we cannot believe, since in another place we find him declaring, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Matthew 28:18 so that where Christ speaks of himself as inferior to the Father, as having received glory from the Father, as receiving life from the Father, and of the Father being greater than he, he must invariably be regarded as alluding to himself in his mediatorial office only, and not in his divine character. He is equal with the Father in nature, subordinate to him only in office. On this truth hinges all the glory and efficacy of redemption. It was then essential to his fitness as the surety and mediator of his covenant people that he should be bone of their bone and flesh of their flesh. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part in the same. It behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. The book of Hebrews The nature of his office and the success of his undertaking required that every divine and human perfection should meet and center in him. He was to be the middle person between God and man. He was to bring together these two extremes of being, the infinite and the finite. He was to mediate for the offended creator and the offending creature. How could he possibly accomplish this great and peculiar work without a union of the two natures, the divine and the human? Jehovah could admit of mediation only by one of equal holiness and glory, and man could only negotiate in this great business of reconciliation with one in all points sin accepted like unto himself. Behold this wondrous union in the person of Jesus. As man... He was made under the law, honoring it in its precepts by his obedience and in its penalty by his sufferings. As God, Jesus imparted a dignity to that obedience and a virtue to those sufferings which rendered them eternally efficacious in the salvation of men, glorious in the sight of angels, and infinitely satisfactory to law and to justice. You must not stand aloof now from the pure humanity of your blessed Lord. It was humanity that obeyed, that bled and died for you. Cling to the doctrine of his deity. It was God in the man that rendered his obedience meritorious for your justification and his death effectual for your redemption. O glorious person of the God-man mediator! What a foundation is here laid for a poor condemned sinner to build upon. What a new and living way to God is opened. What a wide door he has to his very heart. He may come now and feel that not a perfection of Jehovah is trampled upon in his coming, that not an iota of his law is dishonored in his salvation. Instead, the law appears in its richest luster, and every perfection shines in its resplendent glory in the full and free redemption of a sinner through the blood and righteousness of the Son of God. Is it any wonder that over the door of mercy should be written in letters of brightness that might dazzle an angel's eye? Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The Holy Ghost witnesses to the personal glory of Jesus when he brings a soul to count all other glory as loss, and to hang upon Christ as all his salvation. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Philippians 3, 7 and 8. The Spirit witnesses to the atoning work of Jesus in his priestly office. We have already seen that the foundation of the work of Christ is the Godhead of his nature. It's important that the eye be kept immovably fixed upon this as we survey the atoning work of our Lord. Every step we take in developing that work introduces us to new wonders as we keep the glory of the person of Christ in view.